So, Masters of the Universe Revolution is finally here on Netflix, and as we guessed, it picks up right where Revelation ends. And, if you have still not managed to watch the previous season, you can simply watch the recap video that we released a few days ago. Now, when Madeline Netflix entrusted Kevin Smith with the task of making a reboot for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, they were not exactly aiming for a complete modernization of the franchise. In fact, the 2021 release, Masters of the Universe, Revelation, aimed to serve as a seamless continuation of He-Man's original adventures from the 1980s syndicated animated series, specifically targeting the adult fan base who had fond memories of the show from their childhood. However, this strategic approach faced a lot of backlash and trolling from adult fans who grew up watching the series and were displeased with the bold decision to seemingly kill off the main character in the very first episode. While Revelation ultimately restored the balance, its conclusion left fans feeling disgruntled, and Kevin Smith himself was stung by the response. Surprisingly, Smith has returned with a sequel that appears to be an effort to address and rectify some of the criticisms fans had about the previous reboot by delivering a lively and vibrant He-Man vs. Skeletor narrative. Do you guys remember how in the second episode of the previous season, Tila and Andra infiltrated Snake Mountain and found out that Triclops and some of Skeletor's minions have formed a peculiar technological cult devoted to worshipping an entity known as Motherboard? Back then, it felt like a minor, whimsical, comedic element in the bigger tale, much like how the franchise used to be back in the 80s. But in reality, they were actually building up for the impending doom in the second season, which Revolution beautifully picks up and delivers. So, without wasting another moment, let's find out how Masters of the Universe Revolution redeemed itself with its banger ending. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Prince Adam grapples with the death of his father and is forced to choose his fate. Right from the very beginning of the new season, Prince Adam takes charge of Eternia's forces, leading them on a dangerous expedition into the depths of Subternia with a mission to reclaim the souls of their fallen champions ensnared by the malevolent Scareglow, who subjected them to his cruel whims after Evil Lynn destroyed Praternia in the previous season and robbed them of their eternal peace. The entire crew is here, King Randor in a very Iron Man-ish tech armor suit. Andra is no longer a novice in battle. Duncan is whooping ass as usual, and of course there is He-Man and the Sorceress showing off their own abilities. Despite the triumph over Scareglow and the liberation of trapped souls from his hellish clutches, their joy is short-lived. King Randor is suffering from organ failure, so in his weakened and ailing condition, he accepts his fate and requests Adam and Tila to let him peacefully pass, acknowledging the inevitability of mortality. Before taking his last breath, Randor imparts a crucial decision to Adam, the choice between wielding the scepter of a king or the sword of a champion. He believes that no one can bear the burden of both roles, leaving Adam to contemplate his true calling. Simultaneously, Tila learns that souls that wander around without being able to go to Praternia eventually fade. So, determined to bring solace to Randor's spirit, she embarks on a quest to resurrect Praternia. But of course, remaking heaven in a day ain't no easy deal. So grappling with the limitations of her own magic, Tila seeks guidance from her mother. The former sorceress revealed that the restoration of Praternia requires the convergence of the ancient magic of Ka, Zoar, and Havok. Tila's journey leads her to Darksmoke in order to track down Lord Granamir, the dragon guardian of Ka, who indulges in the venerable snake magic, and there she finds evil Lin. Lin is trying to seek redemption of her sins by nursing a sick Granamir, who is soon going to die after her antics on the world, as seen in Revelation. Skeletor is actually Adam's uncle. Skeletor, or should I say Skeletech, is now augmented with technological enhancements and serves the enigmatic motherboard, who is actually a puppet in Hordak's grand design to subjugate Eternia under the Horde Empire. On the other hand, amidst the solemn ceremony of King Rander's funeral, Adam confesses his reluctance to follow in his father's footsteps. The moment is abruptly interrupted by the unexpected appearance of Keldor, Randor's long-presumed dead half-brother, and King Miro's illegitimate son. Surviving against all all odds, Keldor distinguishes himself in a clash against Skeletor's technologically enhanced forces, urging Adam to relinquish the throne, asserting his rightful place as Miro's firstborn. However, Keldor's true identity as Skeletor is soon revealed, a pawn in Hordak's elaborate scheme to seize control of Eternia. Now, Skeletor is a sucker for attention, and when he tries to upsell himself in front of Hordak, he unknowingly embarrasses Motherboard, who basically mops the floor with him. Motherboard's harsh punishment inadvertently unlocks Skeletor's repressed memory 
memories, disclosing that he has always been Keldor. He was King Randor's stepbrother, who was sent away and hails from the distant island planet of Anwat Gar, so in fact he had the right to the Eternian throne. However, Anwat Gar fell victim to Hordak's invasion, and that is how Hordak took Keldor in. Under his tutelage, Keldor was transformed into a warrior, and later Hordak equipped him with the Havoc Staff, and that's how he became the infamous Skeletor. When Hordak first instructed a newly transformed Skeletor to invade Eternos, he failed. So, Hordak erased Skeletor's memory and confined him to the Snake Mountain. Later, with the assistance of Motherboard, Hordak orchestrated Skeletor's rise to power as the King of Eternos. Meanwhile, Adam, recognizing the Sword of Power's potential to neutralize Motherboard's nanotechnology, entrusts Duncan and Orko with enhancing the sword's capabilities through Gwildor the Locksmith in order to safeguard the citizens of Eternia. On the other hand, in Granamir's lair, Tila teams up with Lynn to persuade Granamir to bestow the magic of Ka upon Tila for the revival of Paternia. While they were all away, Skeletor, disguised as Keldor, used his influence as the king to send Adam to Snake Mountain without an army or the Sword of Power to battle Hordak's Horde. When Adam reaches Snake Mountain, he finds the Eternian crown, and that's how he realizes Keldor was in fact Skeletek, and the Horde was all his doing. Now, with the army weakened, Eternia is under Skeletor's hold, who calls for Motherboard and Hordak's entire Horde to take over the nation. Exploiting this newfound authority, they tampered with the realm's magic, and as Motherboard taps into Grayskull's magical data, it strips Adam of his powers while transforming the Eternian population into automatons. While Hordak and Skeletor take over Eternia, Tila and Lin regroup with Duncan. Gwildor races against time to augment the sword, and Orko valiantly confronts Hordak's monstrous minions. Unfortunately, by then, Adam is imprisoned with Cringer and his mother, but is soon rescued by Andra. Now Skeletor, having ascended to the throne, realizes he has been a pawn in Hordak's game. In a defiant act, he slays Motherboard, confronting Hordak and recalling how he was swayed by him long ago. Hordak, being a proponent of technology and despiser of magic, is caught off guard as Skeletor masterfully blends both magic and technology to ultimately defeat him. In the chaos, Lin takes the opportunity to seize the staff of Havok, but Skeletor, imbued with a newfound power, emerges with a massive upgrade. He literally does not need the staff to channel magic and basically could conjure it all by himself. Meanwhile, Adam goes into his late father's private inventory, only to emerge in the same armored tech battlesuit to fight off Hordak's tech minions. He-Man and the Sorceress finally embrace the tension. After Lin entrusts Tila with the staff, she uses all the three staffs with the hope to unite the triad of ancient magics to create Praternia, but the overwhelming power proves too much for Tila to handle, leaving the fate of Eternia hanging in the balance. At the right moment, Gwildor makes a timely entrance, presenting the enhanced Sword of Power to Adam. As Tila's efforts begin to take a toll on her, Adam, without hesitation, makes the decision to enter the vortex created by her, alongside his upgraded sword, and in Invoking the power of Grayskull, he provides her with a much-needed boost, allowing her to channel the power of Grayskull through him. In a breathtaking transformation, he metamorphoses into an upgraded version of He-Man, while simultaneously, Tila is bestowed with the incredible power of becoming the Supreme Sorceress. This transformative process alters both of them, prompting Adam and Tila to move beyond the lingering uncertainty of their relationship and seal their connection with a kiss by acknowledging their long-suppressed feelings for one another. This scene finally gives us old fans what we have wanted to see, so the nod to the fan service here on Smith's part is right on. Anyways, after this poignant moment, Adam encourages Tila to concentrate on revitalizing Paternia, and she takes to the skies to utilize her enhanced powers to bring back Paternia and restore the once home for the deceased. Adam immediately instructs Lin and Orlax to protect her while asking the others to assist him in battle. On the other hand, Skeletor is busy turning the brainwashed public of Eternia into his own skeletal minions amalgamated with his personal blend of of magic and technology, but Adam stops this by intervening decisively and shattering the spell that held the populace captive, ultimately disrupting Skeletor's control over them. The last battle is no less than a battle of blood. In a climactic showdown, we get what we have been waiting for since the release of the first season. The hero and villain collide, each wielding their distinctive fusion of technology and magic. Skeletor, armed with his magical nanotechnology, squares off against Adam, who brandishes his enhanced sword of power. In the middle of this epic battle, Orko and Lin serve as guardians, shielding Tila from Skeletor's crazy army as she embarks on the pivotal ritual to resurrect Praternia. However, Skeletor channeling his 
formidable might, summons the ancient Techno-Titans, and as the conflict intensifies, even Granomir, the ancient dragon, arrives to tip the scales in favor of the heroes, but sadly loses his life in the fight. Meanwhile, as Adam teetered on the brink of defeat, Tila completed the final stages of her spell, successfully resurrecting Praeternia. This act not only granted a unique form of immortality to the departed, but also absolved Evil Lynn of the guilt associated with its destruction. With Tila's ritual reaching its climax, the spirit of King Randor, alongside the ghosts of Eternian heroes past, enters the fray, decisively shifting the tide. In a final desperate attempt, Skeletor sought to end Adam's life, but the timely intervention of the ghost of Randor beside He-Man proved pivotal in overcoming Skeletor's onslaught. Plus, with Praeternia's resurrection, the souls caught between Eternia and Praeternia were finally liberated. Though Skeletor was vanquished, he clung to the spirit of Randor with the hope of sending him to Subternia instead, but Adam, fueled by the immense power coursing through him, channeled it through his sword, transforming Skeletor back into Keldor and stripping him of his dark, magical powers and augmented abilities, ultimately restoring peace and balance to Eternia. On a side note, the scene of Keldor accepting his defeat while observing the assembled heroes seemed a lot like a defeated Loki looking at the Avengers in the Avengers. Interestingly, even Keldor's arc bore resemblance to that of Loki, because both were adopted children seeking power, but ultimately took the villainous route when denied their rightful place. Additionally, Keldor's blue skin also paralleled Loki's original blue appearance, due to his connection with the Jotuns. Anyways, the battle finally ends with Keldor being locked away in Eternian prison as the remaining horde departs into space, after being relieved of their duties since Skeletor no longer held sway over them. Adam turns Eternia into a democracy. In the aftermath of Skeletor's defeat, Prince Adam steps forward to address the citizens of Eternia with a bold declaration of ending the monarchy in Eternina and the dawn of a new era of democracy. Passionately advocating for this significant shift, he attributed the entire Hordak and Skeletor fiasco to his own decision to appoint the wrong king simply because he was confused about assuming the throne. To break free from the cycle of nepotism, Adam advocated for the people to take on the responsibility of choosing choosing their leader, as he firmly believed that true governance should reside in the hands of the people, empowering them to shape their own destiny. Meanwhile, Keldor, now confined as a prisoner beneath the imposing structure of Castle Greyskull, bides his time, nursing vengeful plans for a potential resurgence. But I think the show missed an opportunity in exploring how he was wronged due to the fear of bad optics. This oversight could have delved into the nuances of his descent into villainy, forcing Adam to re-evaluate his perception of Randor. But again, the show didn't exactly have that sort of time in his season. Anyways, this scene ends on a light-hearted note as, in a surprising turn, Andra decides to step into the political arena, running for office. As for Adam and Tila, they opt to prioritize their relationship and contribute to maintaining the peace and tranquility of Eternia. How does the ending of Masters of the Universe Revolution build itself up for another season? So, in the concluding moments of the show, a new character named Zodak emerges as the leader of the Cosmic Enforcers. This enigmatic team, donning matching helmets, convenes at a coliseum built on an asteroid suspended by a colossal figure, and this asteroid is interconnected with others through vibrant chains. After witnessing Evil Lynn's remarkable display of heroism, Zodak expresses a desire to recruit her into this mysterious group. Now, a Originally introduced by Mattel as a somewhat generic villain, Zodak underwent quite a few transformations in DC Comics, evolving into a centrist character. So He-Man and the Masters of the Universe further continued this nuanced portrayal, but the iteration in Revolution appears to be a neutral figure, and the Cosmic Enforcers almost seem like Marvel's Watchers, overseeing Eternia's events without using their powers to make any direct intervention unless it's absolutely necessary. While this might align with Zodak's neutral stance, it poses a potential challenge for someone like Evil Lynn because, despite her shift to the good side, her chaotic nature and recent alignment may clash with the notion of remaining a neutral figure. But again, the offer made by Zodak is left open-ended, so we don't really know if Lynn ended up accepting it. Season 3 of Masters of the Universe could potentially explore whether she embraces this new role or perhaps challenges the Cosmic Enforcers for their passive stance, despite having a considerable amount of power at their disposal. The narrative transitions then the neutral asteroids to what appears to be Etheria, the home planet of Hordak and his 
his horde. Apparently, Hordak's body, retrieved from the battlefield, rests in a healing Bacta tank, and a masked figure visits Hordak, reassuring him to rest as Horde Prime executes its plan. The mysterious character declares their intention to kill Skeletor and He-Man once Hordak regains strength. If you have seen all the five episodes, it is quite apparent that this masked individual is Despera, who is Adam's supposed twin sister, Adora, kidnapped by Hordak and trained to become a Horde leader. The revelation of Hordak's abduction of Adora is hinted at in a flashback, where Hordak escapes Eternia, leaping from a tower while Randor and Skeletor watch, visibly distressed. Much like the shocking information about Skeletor's true identity as Keldor, the revelation that Adora is Despara is poised to be a revelation that will profoundly impact Adam and potentially all of Eternia in the yet-to-be-announced Season 3 of Masters of the Universe. What is our verdict on this season? Revolution embraces a sense of visual nostalgia in its animation, seamlessly evolving from the hand-drawn aesthetic of the original He-Man series, which harmoniously aligns with contemporary shows that aim to recapture the look and feel of classic animations. Plus, the characters and backgrounds are meticulously rendered, featuring vibrant colors that create a visually engaging experience. Even the use of CGI to enhance scenes rich in high fantasy and sci-fi elements, such as He-Man's power-up sequence, is amazing. One of the animation's most noteworthy aspects is its deliberate avoidance of an overly smooth appearance. The homage to the traits of 80s TV animation, born out of animators navigating budget and time constraints, is quite evident, but this results in characters moving in a charmingly janky manner and snapping between poses, preserving the nostalgic charm of the original while seamlessly integrating it into a modern style, which truly is an accomplishment that distinguishes Revolution's animation style. This time around, Masters of the universe. Revolution offers little to concern those easily offended. The narrative features more pronounced religious allegorical themes, and the dynamic between He-Man and Tila includes a noticeable undercurrent of opposite-sex attraction. Moreover, the condensed storytelling, possibly compounded by how small Eternia really is, keeps the narrative consistently engaging, but makes it challenging to establish stakes as the powered-up heroes swiftly charge through challenges. While never dull, the fast pacing does raise concerns about the characters' power levels with some becoming so remarkably powerful that they border on indestructible deities by the end. Revolution ensures the inclusion of as many fan-favorite characters as possible, leaving the mythology in a new and intriguing place for potential future exploration. This season appears to be making up for the fact that Revelation strayed too far from canon, evident in its deliberate embrace of fanservice. While I appreciate the overflowing content, there is still a lingering sense that the creators may believe this could be their last opportunity to contribute to the franchise, which is why the result is a packed narrative that attempts to cover a vast array of elements. While this eagerness to please is appreciated, I wish there was more breathing room and a deeper exploration of the expansive world beyond the familiar settings of the Royal Palace, Castle Greyskull, and Snake Mountain. Overall, this season serves an impressive visual appeal, offering a storyline and writing style that will feel reassuringly familiar for longtime fans. Despite its drawbacks, Masters of the Universe Revolution still stands out as a fantastic continuation of the franchise. By making bold choices, the series manages to reinvent and build upon a narrative that many thought concluded long ago, adding fresh layers to the beloved Masters of the Universe saga. So, have you watched the new season yet? Let us know of your thoughts in the comments below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.